On a lazy summer afternoon, a love-struck couple drive into the woods of rural Washington, looking for the perfect hideaway, a secluded spot to carry out their secret romance. What they find is horror. They came across a log that was across the road. When they got out of the vehicle to move the log, they saw a body lying approximately 15 feet beyond that log. She was on her back. She was wearing a pair of bikini-style underwear, wearing a pair of knee-length socks, a pair of boots, and nothing else. Her blue jeans and clothing had been kind of strewn about. She had a wound to the right side of her head. And she's breathing, but she's not saying anything. The man sits her in the passenger seat of his little two-seater sports car, and the woman held her head up to keep her airway open. When they got to the hospital, it appeared that she was still alive. But by the time they were able to start examining her, she was deceased. She didn't have any ID on her, no purse, no driver's license, no identification card. So they didn't know who they had. Earlier that afternoon, before this grim discovery, 20-year-old Jody Loomis had jumped on her bike, headed for the stable, and a ride on her horse, Saudi. It was a beautiful day. Back in 1972, I'm 12. I took off down the road to meet my girlfriend. Jody decided she was going to go to Saudi and be back before dark. And she pedaled off. I was on my way home when I got a page. There was a suspicious death at Stevens Memorial. The duty nurse directed me back to a locked room where the body was. That was a troubling sight to have her laying there with just shoes and her glasses were askew on her face and she had a bullet hole in her head. We could see that there was dirt and leaves were stuffed in her underwear. Her boots would have been uh, put on after the underwear was pulled back up. I observed what appeared to be seminal fluid in the crotch of the underwear. It was obviously some kind of a sexually motivated homicide. She was able to put her panties back on. She put her right shoe on, but she was apparently tying her left shoe when the killer shot her in the head. Jody's killer is still out there, and people fear he might strike again. That fear turns to panic when other young women begin to vanish. An individual was abducting young women off the streets. It wasn't any particular profile other than they were women and they were young and they were pretty. There was a serial killer killing college-age girls in the Pacific Northwest. The individual that police believed responsible for that was a guy by the name of Ted Bundy. The similarities between Jody's case and the Bundy murders were that she was the right age group, college age, and probably the right hairstyle. A lot of them had their hair parted down the center. Jody parted her hair down the center. People in Snohomish fear this notorious killer had struck again. Yet investigators realize that Jody's murder doesn't match up with Ted Bundy's M.O. Ted Bundy would put his arm in a sling or carry a crutch or do something as a ruse to get a college student to help him. They had been seen getting into a vehicle willingly with somebody. Well, this isn't the same thing. She was riding a bicycle. They were bludgeoned. In Jody's case, she was shot. It just didn't fit right. Investigators eliminate Ted Bundy, leaving them with no solid suspects in Jody's murder. The case of the young woman who went out on a bike ride and never came back goes as cold as the winter winds that blow down from Canada. As time progressed, there were no more leads, and there was 
nothing. There was just silence for years and years and years, and then decades. I really felt that nobody cared. Jody's murder and other unsolved cases get a fresh look from a new investigative unit. So everyone realized that there was real need to have a designated team of detectives doing cold cases. Jody's case fit the criteria that the cold case team was looking at. It was a homicide, sexually motivated homicide, and he could tell she was a completely innocent victim. One of the best tools that we had as a cold case detective was DNA. With Jody's case, intact spermatozoa had been taken from the vaginal swabs at autopsy. So everything that they would need appear to be present in this case. We knew that we could go get these vaginal swabs, the slides that had been sent to the hospital, and we were gonna get a DNA profile and upload it to CODIS and solve this case right away. Justice for Jody hangs on a DNA sample from her crime scene evidence. But investigators, again, hit a major obstacle. Then we found out that there was no DNA evidence anywhere. We couldn't find it. All were missing. You know, we were just flabbergasted. And it was just devastating when we realized that those things had been lost. So investigators search for another sample. But we had Jody's shirt, her bra, jeans, and both of her boots. I sent all of those items to the State Patrol Crime Lab to see if they could find any DNA evidence that might have been missed or left on another article of clothing. I got a phone call from the forensic analyst at the State Patrol Crime Lab telling me that he found a spot of DNA evidence on Jody Loomis's left boot. We were so excited about it that we drove to the crime lab and went back to his workstation and he showed us the slide and I counted 25 spermatozoa on it. And it was like, yeah, we, we actually do have what we need to solve this case. It was wonderful. You now have a DNA profile and if you can't match that up with anybody, you don't have anybody to pursue. No suspect, no one being handcuffed, no one being charged and no hope of that occurring anytime in the near future. I didn't know if I'd ever see the face of who murdered my sister. For 10 long years, there's not much to hold on to. That all changes with one forensic advance. Detective Scharf became aware of a new use of technology called forensic genealogy. Using a suspect's DNA, a genetic genealogist searches for partial matches in public DNA databases. Those partial matches lead to a family tree. Someone in that tree could end up being an exact match. The DNA information was sent to a genetic genealogist and actually she spent 58 hours over a three-day period to come up with a son of Jaquetta and Albert Miller. Jaquetta and Albert Miller had six sons and one daughter. So now law enforcement had six males that one of them was likely the donor of that DNA. One had sexual criminal history, and that was Terrence Miller. A couple of years after Jody's murder, he was arrested for statutory rape and child molestation, but he got a deferred prosecution for going through counseling, so Terry didn't go to prison. So now that we knew that he was a sex offender, we started following Terrence Miller around. They've got to get a known sample of DNA from the suspect surreptitiously so you're not alerting him. 
and then compare that to the original DNA sample. The only way this groundbreaking technology pays off is if undercover officers could get a sample of Terrence Miller's DNA. We asked them to follow Terry around until they could get anything that touched his lips, because we wanted a saliva sample. That's your best evidence to test for DNA. So they followed him to a casino. They watched him buy a cup of coffee and then discard that cup in a garbage can. Seconds after that coffee cup was thrown in the garbage, detectives secured it, put it into a plastic bag. They brought me the cup. I booked it into evidence and took it to the crime lab and crossed my fingers. Just over a week later, the crime lab contacted uh, Scharf. It was a match to Jody Loomis's case. So at that point, we finally identified a killer after, what, 46 years? It was, it was a real high point. Miller was ultimately charged with one count of first-degree murder, so premeditated murder. When Mr. Miller was in jail, he made a number of phone calls to his wife. Every phone call is recorded. He had made comments to the effect that, you know, I'm going to jail. They've got me. They got the DNA. The accused killer's trial finally begins. Monday morning, I was at my desk. And about 9.30, we received a phone call from patrol. They were at the Miller house. Terrence Miller had apparently uh, committed suicide that morning. We were told the jury had not been informed that they were continuing to deliberate. Then they came back a little bit later on and said, all right, everybody to the courtroom. And the jury announces that he's guilty. Oh, thank goodness. There was no justice when that trigger was pulled. I wanted him to go to prison because I pretty much knew what was going to happen to him in prison, and it was not going to be pretty. I wanted them to see him be handcuffed and led from the courtroom. He took that from them. 